Hello. Mike Hello. Oh, hey, we have stuff. Cool. Thank you very much for coming uh, to this somewhat experimental talk. Soup's experimental. I haven't given a talk like this before. I don't know whether you have. Um, I'm a woman. I give this talk every day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we're done. Um, that's kind of it. No, um, so this is Jennifer. Uh, she is an angry feminist, as you can see by her t-shirt. Uh, she enjoys cooking delicious meals for her husband and for company. Um, I don't think that extends to while we're in London, though. Uh, loves coding and FPS games, equally matched by her love of gardening, hostessing, and other stepford -esque activities. That doesn't say any of the awesome things she does uh, for women and for tech and for all kinds of things that we may get onto later on. Yes, and if you were not aware, this is John Skeet. Applause as well. There we go. He is the husband of Holly Webb, a best-selling author of over 100 children's books. Her recent works include Snowcat, Evie's War, The Princess and the Suffragette. She is a frequent contributor at international literary festivals. Uh, John Wright, C Sharp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think some people may have picked up on that. <laughs> I love it. Cool. So uh, why are we doing this? I said in my previous talk I'm you know, aiming for topics that will eventually get to empty rooms. Um, I gave a talk at NDC Oslo on dates and times, and somehow it was still standing room only. And I just quipped before the talk, uh, do you know what, if people are going to show up for me talking about just anything, I'll give a talk on feminism. And someone decided to tweet that and got lots of retweets, so kind of here we are. I would um, like to point out you were also wearing your Code Like a Girl shirt right. when you said that. So. Yep. Yep, um, which I was wearing this Monday, so it's in the wash at the moment, so I have my prone to bursting into feminist rants uh, t-shirt instead. Step 101 of feminism, have many, many t-shirts. Yeah. Cool. So um, yeah, we decided it'd be fun to do a talk about that. Yeah, um, and so I thought if I just submit a talk on feminism, that may not get past the sort of abstract filtering. Uh, so instead, we wrote the abstract that you've seen, which is, this isn't about feminism at all. It's about creating a more just society, and you, know, you may have interesting goals that aren't around feminism about how you want to change the world. And this is sort of somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but I, I genuinely believe this is a useful talk, even if you don't care about feminism, uh, as a way of encouraging you to go and change the world. How many people have heard us talk about software changes the world? We're always doing that. And you know, have we thought about what we want to change the world into? Um, you may have very different goals for how you want to change the world than I do, and that's absolutely fine. So maybe it's around uh, climate change, which is real, um, and, uh, or maybe a, a friend of mine does stuff for Global Fishing Watch to try to avoid you know, fish being completely um, removed from the sea. There can be any number of good causes, and to some extent, this isn't, it's not entirely about femi feminism so much as feminist activism and how to get started if you're a noob to it, like I sort of still am, but was particularly a few years ago. And so if you're thinking, I want to change the world around climate change, oh, but there's nothing I can do, so I will just sit down. Uh, it's like, no, there are things you can do and try to apply everything we say here to whatever you care about most. Hopefully, as a byproduct, you will also care about feminism more and uh, see feminism as less of a scary word. And if we end up, chances are we're not going to end up with spare time at the end. But nope. if we do, and even afterwards, uh, we can be a safe space to ask questions that you think other feminists might shout at you. Um, Speaking so. of angry feminists, that's the other thing, is if I were to have submitted an abstract on this talk, the audience would have been full of only women, and then the guys in the back would be like, oh man, one of those, one of those angry bitches again, what's she got to complain about? I don't see any issues, issues with women in tech. Right, so. right, and, and the people, the women who would have come are probably already feminists and would have known all the stuff and be going, yeah, I'm going to come and support, because feminists are really good at supporting each other, um, largely. We'll, uh, uh, we'll get there, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. So uh, think about sort of what's stopping you from doing activism. What are your unique talents? Uh, and that can be unique to you as a person. Or how does being a software engineer help you uh, be active? And we'll apply all of that to feminism. And Furbies. And Furbies, yeah. <laughs> so we, we were thinking, you know, what, 
What kind of things do we want to change the world? We like Furbies. Furbies should be a thing again. They should be in every child's Christmas list, etc. Uh, do you know you can hack the latest Furbies too? If you follow Chloe Condon on Twitter, she has a video on how to ha hack the latest Furbies to say, yes, queen. <laughs> <laughs> and fundamentally, you know, uh, they make for really good gifts and things. Truth. Cool, so <laughs> I mentioned some of the big problems in the world in terms of climate change and stuff. Uh, Jennifer, why don't you, as you kind of have more experience of this, say, what are the big problems that women face? Oh, what are the big problems that women face? Um, sexual harassment is one, uh, definitely an issue there. Uh, how many women in the audience have ever gotten at a developer conference? Oh, wait, you write code? You're not a designer? Hands, hands, yeah. Uh, so death by a th thousand paper cuts, we are always assumed to be lesser capable than we actually may be. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is uh, women in society have kind of been raised to have all these burdens put upon them. We are supposed to be caretakers. We are supposed to be providers. We are supposed to maintain everybody's emotional health around us. Um, and so a lot of that work gets put onto women. Uh, this Christmas, I was on Twitter while I was wrapping Christmas presents because that duty often follows to women. And I'm seeing all the dudes tweeting about tech and stuff. And I'm like, how many of y'all can do this because your partners are the ones doing all the Christmas preparation? Be aware of that. But these are like small things that end up turning into big problems of why we see such big disparities um, in the world. And by putting all this burden on women, we are assuming that men are not capable of doing a lot of this work, which is also bullshit. It should yeah. not be a novelty for a dad to be coding with his kid in his arms or something like that. And so these ideas and these rigid um, gender roles all lead to these big problems. Cool. Uh, I was just thinking in terms of, I was wondering how I would enumerate the big problems. And this isn't a party political thing, but I'm a member of the Women's Equality Party, and we have seven goals. And it's always a good test for me to remember whether I can remember the seven you know, main targets. So ending violence against women, uh, equality in education, uh, equality equal parenting, um, equality of representation in politics, uh, equality of representation in and by the media. So you know, no more uh, women's sports getting one paragraph. Everything's about the men's football. And you never, it's not men's football, is it? It's just football and women's football. And what does that tell you? Um, I, I, I shouldn't use my hands when I'm meant to be counting things. Um, okay, while you think, I'll talk about other media. <laughs> I am so sick of seeing men in sitcoms portrayed as incompetent. Like, if you look at well, Friends, I know it's a TV show, but, like, it goes both ways, right? Yep. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Did you think uh, of the other ones yet? Uh, oh, yeah, was, <laughs> I couldn't remember where I was up to, but um, equality and health, um, and I think that may have been the lot. Yeah. Nailed it. Hopefully. Big problems. We'll, we'll check in the video. <laughs> cool. Uh, so we, I don't think we've used any scary words yet. If Jennifer had said one of the big problems is emotional labor, then that might have been sort of, oh, what the hell is she talking about? I don't know what's going on uh, because we don't have a shared vocabulary about this. And this is why feminism can sometimes seem a bit scary, because there are all these words uh, that a few years ago I'd heard of patriarchy, but couldn't really define it, and we'll see whether we can define it now. Um, privilege, I got an idea of. How many people have heard about privilege and male privilege and white privilege and things? Um, because I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, uh, hopefully we can be honest. This is a fairly safe space. I'm not gonna ask you to say anything uh, hugely embarrassing. How many of you have a problem with the idea of privilege or maybe just the use of the word privilege? Okay, that's, that's surprising, because I know that people do, and I'm gonna assume that maybe there were some people who weren't willing to put their hands up, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, so when we talk about privilege later on, I know that when I've written about it, I have received some very mild flack, which, if I'd been a woman writing about it, would have been death threats and doxing and rape threats. Um, but, you know, a lot of people with a lot of privilege are not comfortable with the idea of it. Partly, I think, because of the choice of word, but. You know, I don't get to choose which word marginalized people use to describe things. Um, so we're going to go into a few of these. Um, you know, I hadn't even noticed that emotional labor was on the slide that, when I uh, gave that as an example. So everything Jennifer was saying before about uh, 
things about women keeping the family ticking, basically, remembering mm -hmm. all the birthdays. Um, and you know, for Planning my own family. Planning the office parties. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, sitting down uh, in a meeting and who's gonna take notes? Everyone looks to the women, or hopefully not. Um, yeah, remembering birthdays, doing the wrapping, all this sort of thing is what we mean by emotional labor. Mm -hmm. Cool, so it's yeah. important to have a shared vocabulary uh, because otherwise we can be Jennifer and I can be ranting, and people could be misunderstanding what we're ranting about. So they'll rant back saying, no, it's not like that at all. It's like, but I didn't say it was like that. It was about like something else. Um, I know that Rich Dawkins uh, and the Archbishop of Canterbury have had interesting debates where uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury said, yeah, I wouldn't be a Christian if I believed that Christianity meant what you believe Christianity means. Um, so you know, the point of words is that we can communicate with each other. If we don't have a shared vocabulary, it's just nonsense. And we know this from DDD and BDD and, and things within the tech industry. We know it's important to have shared communication. This is also how we learn how to communicate with our Furbies, as we have to learn what language they speak from the dictionary. Right. And <laughs> so here we have kami minunluwa. And uh, can you remember what that one means? No. OK. <laughs> we have one example in this slide deck where we do know what it means right at the very end. Yes. Uh, we're more uh, concerned about defining some of these words relational. So, um, you want to start defining? So, well, we're gonna, we, we have specific slides for patriarchy, privilege, mm -hmm. intersectional feminism. So, uh, we've talked about emotional labor. Should we just quickly talk about toxic ma masculinity and microaggressions? Shall I take toxic masculinity? I'll, I'll be the toxic one. Um, okay. So, I've heard people say that actually toxic masculinity is not a good way of expressing it, and maybe it should be toxic masculine culture. Um, because it's, it's not that being a man is a bad thing, okay? I don't think I've heard any feminists uh, say being a man is a bad thing. It's some of the characteristics which, however we've ended up here, are traditionally associated with being a man, is where the problem is. So it's like, it's fine for boys to rough and tumble, which sounds like a, a really nice way of saying fight, um, and inflict pain on each other and say, that's fine, boys will be boys. Um, and all kinds of, you know, when being competitive ends up getting you tense and worked up and disliking the person that you're competing with instead of, hey, we're trying to each do our best and that sort of testosterone-related aspect. Uh, so whether toxic, you know, more extreme examples come from um, locker room talk. You know, we've all heard locker room talk from you know, some important people. Um, all of this kind of thing doesn't help anyone. So it's obviously uh, bad for women if it's normalized for men behind closed doors uh, to be saying awful things about women. You know, oh, I'd really like to... What, whatever it is, I, I, I find it hard to make myself say the things that I would find offensive to be said around me. Um, but it's clearly a problem if people are saying that behind closed doors and thinking that's okay, and that then some of that, many of those men may never go to act on that explicitly, but by just being present and not calling it out, you're enabling it and saying, Joe, I think that's an okay thing for you to say. And we've kind of, I think, in much of society, addressed that for race. Certainly not all. I, it's like, it would be stupid and ridiculous for me to say that we've solved racial problems. Uh, read um, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race by Renault Eddie Lodge. Um, she, it's fantastic. Um, uh, but, I think it's, it's relatively unusual to be in a situation where someone will say something blatantly racist and everyone just nods along. Um, but that can happen with sexism still these days, and that's part of this toxic masculinity. So we need to all be part of addressing that. Um, I would like to say as well, like these were a lot of issues about behavior towards others and behavior towards women, but toxic masculinity very much encompasses behavior men have towards themselves. Right. Um, so who um, in the room has ever looked at a cocktail menu and seen a cocktail that looks delicious 
and decided not to order it because it's not a beer or it's not a bourbon or it's not a whiskey and you will be judged for getting a girly drink. That's toxic masculinity, y'all. How many delicious drinks could you be having if we didn't have this problem in society? So I had never realized that me loving girly drinks and cocktails was me being a feminist you know, for, for years and years and years. <laughs> We, oh, some of us have always called them foo-foo drinks. Um, but yeah, I have never seen a cocktail that I'll be afraid to order because of, yeah, it may be because I've already had too many or whatever. Um, and <laughs> hey, I don't like beer and things. But yeah, and, and I don't think anyone has ever called me out and said, you're not a real man for not drinking beer. But I can certainly imagine that that may well be due to the company I keep rather than because I don't happen to like beer and that, Everyone's fine with that. Uh, I'm sure in different aspects of society that would be deemed a bad thing, and it's really not. Do you want to call out microaggressions? Yes, microaggressions. So I mentioned a bit of these earlier when women at tech conferences are getting comments like, oh, well, you know, you, you must not be an engineer, oh, you must be a designer, and there's not necessarily any malintent or somebody is setting out to be like, I'm trying to be sexist by saying this. But the problem is, is a woman, when you're hearing these kind of things over and over again, even if there's no malintent underneath, it doesn't stop it from wearing down on you any less. And so it's this idea of micro, meaning like it's not a, a big thing or something that's intentionally done, but that doesn't make it any less destructive towards our mentalities or our self-reflection on, um, on ourselves as who we are as women and how capable we are. Just to give a, a completely different example of how micro somethings can be annoying. Have you ever been in a situation where you've been trying to code the next feature or whatever, and people keep coming up and asking a small favor? And each person that asks for a small favor is being entirely reasonable. They think they're asking for something small, and each of them is asking for something small. But by the time you've had that all day or maybe all week and got nothing else done, you suddenly explode at the next person. So, no, I, I can't just look at your, you know, your two-line code review. I know it's small, but no, I can't. And suddenly, you're the bad guy. But actually, you'd had all this stuff, and it's, it's not your fault. You were, you've been being nice. All these small things were happening, and it just builds up and up and up. So that's why they are microaggressions that each individual thing may not trigger something. Um, but if you suddenly find that Actually, you've said something wrong, and I'll probably mention later on that we all, certainly every male feminist I know has screwed up, and I expect I will do so again. Um, and if I screw up in a way that happens to cause someone to really rant at me, I've got to kind of take that, because I don't know what else they've had that day. So if you ever find yourself in that situation, imagine that it was someone asking for just that two-line code review when you've been trying to get a feature done or even just leave the office for like the last half hour or hour. Is that, I'm not being someone who experiences microaggressions, is that a reasonable analogy? Oh, for sure, because it's like, with women, you might, um, and obviously we tend to call women dramatic and think that we're overly emotional and that kind of thing. Come back, slide. Oh, that's, that's our timer saying we spent too long on a slide. Oh, is it? <laughs> no, it's just, yeah. oh. When the, when the computer goes to sleep, that probably means we need to move on. <laughs> yes, but so we're dealing with this all the time, and then there's just going to be that one straw that broke the camel's back, that one comment or that one tweet or that one guy getting pissed off I'm wearing this shirt and decides to tweet about it on the day Kavanaugh gets uh, his prioritized seat. <laughs> yes, um, that, that is exactly how it goes down. So when I first started into feminism, I didn't know what most of these were. And if I had started going, I'm going to fix feminism, I'm going to fix the world from patriarchy, because I've heard of patriarchy, I'll sort that. And if I hadn't listened and found out about these things, it would not have gone well. So think about that, you know, whether it's climate change, whatever. Um, and I'm going to stop making this point fairly soon. Uh, just think about what else you may need to learn about. Because chances are, if you're relatively new in the field, and there are lots of other people who've been doing it for a long time. They will know things. It's kind of strange, but we tend to assume, I will come and fix this. You know, I don't like the way that front-end devs do stuff. I must be better at this. I can, I can solve it and make front-ends much more easily testable or whatever it is. No. You know, smart people have been working on things. 
You're They're laughing. I'll debunk that, that tonight. Talk yeah. shit on .NET Dev. Right. <laughs> cool. Okay. Okay. Your moment first, my moment first. Your moment first. Okay, I'll go first. So um, my first feminist moment wasn't when I thought it was. Um, three years, uh, four years ago, three and a half, uh, I was at Pride, the Pride March in London for the first time, um, marching with the Google float. Um, and I had my whole family there. So it was me and Holly and Ash and Robin and William. And Holly had been nervous about this because she was saying, you know, we're, we're not part of uh, the LGBT community. You know, we can say we're allies, but how, how welcome will we be? And we were absolutely overwhelmed because people came and hugged Holly and said, thank you so much for coming. It's really, the whole thing is better because you are here, because each one of us is here. And we felt so welcomed, and I've usually spoken about this in a church context, that I felt more welcome at a pride march as a straight ally, or someone aspiring to be a straight ally, than I do in church, where you know, no, one's, no one's trying to exclude me, but very few people come bounding up and say, I'm so glad you're here. And I didn't think about that in terms of feminism, but in terms of inclusivity is far more than the lack of exclusivity. So while we're thinking of DNI, and um, diversity and inclusion uh, outreach sort of uh, projects, yeah, we absolutely need to break down barriers, things that are stopping marginalized people from joining with us and being awesome with us. Um, but it can't just be stopping barriers. It's got to be being actively inclusive as well. And it was later that year, and I suspect now that that wasn't a coincidence, uh, that I happened to be sitting on the sofa reading the Geek Feminist Wikia, um, and the, the article I most remember about it is, you know, Guidelines for male allies. Guideline one, shut up. <laughs> okay, and that struck me, and it was, okay. And I read through, and it's like, yeah, th this makes sense. Um, you don't know more about women's experiences than women do. And Jennifer will mention something a little bit later on that. Um, but there was enough there that resonated that I started reading so I read Everyone's Fem Everyone Should Be a Feminist, uh, Bell Hooks, and uh, in particular, Everyday Sexism. You know, we're an industry that claims to be data-led. Read Everyday Sexism because there are references everywhere to reports and surveys and things. And it's particularly striking for me when you read whatever the number is. I'm going to make up a number if it's 30% of women have been sexually assaulted. Okay, suppose it, it's that figure. And you take a step back and say, that can't be right. Surely, you know, if 30% of women have been sexually assaulted, surely someone would have said something about it. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, women have been saying things about it for years, and it's always been, no, no, you can't be right. You can't have been sexually assaulted, because if people were being sexually assaulted, they'd have said so. So don't say so anymore. Okay, so you know, we claim to be data-driven. Read that book. Um, it's the book I recommend if I'm ever on tech podcast and say, oh, what book would you really recommend reading to help your software engineering journey? Read Everyday Sexism. Um, so that was my sort of hello world moment and things went from there. How about you? Um, so I'm a woman, so obviously I was born a feminist, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, how many people have ever suffered from being put in the friend zone? Anybody? Okay, okay. Um, so I, I started playing video games when I was very young, which immersed me in the internet culture, which meant I was online and playing video games and in the internet culture um, right around the time that I was like, you know, growing up and understanding relationships and how those should function. Um, and I always felt the worst guilt for friend zoning because I felt it was my fault that I had spurned attraction towards myself and didn't return it. And I carried this guilt well into my 20s, well into my career, where I thought it was always my fault. And nobody ever talked about this. This wasn't a conversation my parents had. I didn't have any teachers talking about this. I had no support. What I did have is the internet when a woman wrote an article about the fact that it's not our fault that men are attracted to us and we are bad people for not returning that affection. And it blew my fucking mind. Because I had carried all this guilt 
and just like tore myself to shreds and would just internally think of everything I said. And you know, I had adopted this pattern where I just started acting like a raging fucking cunt because I figured that was the best way to avoid that kind of thing happening. Um, and it wasn't until I read that article and went, holy shit, this is what feminism does. I realized that that burden is not my fault. Right. And that was my one of my first many Hello or Hello World feminism moments. And one interesting difference between these Hello World moments is that feminism was empowering for Jennifer, and it was scary for me because I was realizing more about how the world wasn't as rosy as I might have thought it would be. Okay. And that's probably something that men in the audience expect that expect to be. Uh, made thoroughly miserable by feminism to some extent in terms of acknowledging reality. There's awesome things about it as well. The, the feminist community can be really empowering for men as well as for women. And we'll see that some of the uh, aims of feminism absolutely help men as well as women. Uh, but expect to get that whole, oh, wow. Ugh. I can't face the world anymore. It's, it's much worse than I ever thought. Which you know, was the world that Jennifer was seeing before. So yeah, expect a difference in how we approach things. Sorry, that totally reminds me. Uh, so video games and being online in my world normal, um, we were all in an IRC chat room one night. And uh, my friend Ashley pops in and she's like, haha, I got another message. It's funny, I'm always fat, ugly, or a slut. And one of our friends is like, what are you talking about? And we start laughing and we're like, oh, that's the kind of get messages you get playing online as a woman. And our friend had never played online before and she was just blown away. And so we built a website called fatuglyorslutty.com where we posted these abusive messages. But men playing video games had no idea that this was a thing. We got comments after comments after comments of men apologizing and the women laughing being like, ha yeah, that one, I get that one all the time. Oh, you wanna see my dick pic collection? Like, it, that is our normal. Right. And it's, yeah, it's not rosy, Is our next but, slide privilege? Let's... Uh, no, oh, it's patriarchy. No, okay. okay. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll come back to that for yes. privilege. Uh, how are we doing time-wise, by the way? Anyone shout out the time? Ten past. Ten past. Halfway, that's okay. Okay. Yeah. I was cool. like, wait, what time do we start? <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, we call this talk Society N Plus 1.0, uh, How to smash the, smash the Patriarchy and Other Ways of Changing the World. Uh, or I originally submitted that, the abstract with that, never expecting it to get into another conference, and then said to Jennifer, uh, is that okay? Do you, are you okay with that? <laughs> Sorry for the lack of consultation. Um, but patriarchy is a word that is thrown around a lot and almost certainly means different things to different people. Um, I, I would rather fill in gaps of how I understand it after hearing what Jennifer has to say. Uh, so somebody, again, got very mad at me for the wearing this shirt that says, well, the patriarchy isn't gonna fuck itself, telling me I wasn't being inclusive by saying fuck a group of people. The thing is, patriarchy is not a group of people. It is a social construct that puts men, particularly white men, particularly heads of household, meaning like firstborn, you know, patriarchs in charge, and those are the powerful people, those are the decision makers, and that is the meaning of patriarchy. It's not fuck all men. It's fuck a system that only empowers men. Right. Yeah. So if we, if we had a system whereby, and I, I tend to use this in terms of you know, why is diversity important, if you were a recruiter, there's no way you would bin the resumes of everyone who had a surname from N to Z versus A to M. So if it were sort of first half of the alphabetism, you know, no one would think that that was actually saying that people who have a name in the first half of the alphabet are bad people. And it's the same for patriarchy, it is, it's the system and the results of that system which are bad, not men. So we don't hate men. I don't hate men. Uh, I hate some of the things that many men do, uh, but that's a different matter. And I suspect that in most cases, those men would be happier if they didn't do those things as well. We'll get to them loving themselves later. <laughs> yes. Cool, so patriarchy tends to put people into boxes, and this was our second Furby reference in the abstract. So, you know, Furbies are probably reasonably happy being in boxes, and they're really easy to get out of their boxes, uh, but it turns out that it's really hard to get rid of the boxes uh, that we put in society for men and women in particular, um, but also in terms of race and various other things. We will come on to intersectionality later on. Um, 
So if we start making assumptions, the whole, when Jennifer was saying, you know, how many people have been in the tech conference and been assumed not to be an engineer, um, okay, I wasn't doing a scientific survey, but I don't think I saw any men raise their hands. I don't think that's a coincidence. Even if not all women raise their hands, if none of the men do, and quite a lot of the women do, there's something wrong. Um, so it, and it's not just assumptions about what people will do, but then that comes true in itself. Um, as an example of where people often sort of say, oh, feminism's done its, done its thing, we have things like equality of pay. Uh, and there must be pay equality because there's a law saying that there must be, be pay equality. So that means it's all sorted, right? Um, even if we were in the situation where we assumed that people were getting the same pay at the same scale and no one was actually sort of cheating things and doing something obviously illegal, um, my guess is that there are still plenty of places where that happens, um, it doesn't need to be that blatant. So if I'm at level four, and so is a woman, and we have perf reviews, and people happen to write different kinds of comments, so they'll say that the woman is a bit bossy, I'm confident. Um, or maybe as ascribing emotional labor to the woman, and things that could be seen as positive, you know, she helps keep team morale together. It's like, yeah, that's not really the kind of person we're looking to promote. So we could be doing equally awesome tech things, and even doing, we could have exactly the same impact. I could be doing, as a man, I could be doing awesome team morale things as well, but that would be seen as leadership. And so I'd get the promotion instead, and so we'd still be at the situation where men and women at the same piece of scale, level, whatever it's called, are getting the same amount, but suddenly all the men are getting more than all the women, on average. Things like that are where patriarchy comes in. Yes. Random tidbit off that for all the ladies in the room, never tell somebody your previous salary when they ask it when you're interviewing for a job. Um, this is one of the leading factors that has caused um, the gender pay gap is because if women were making less before and the new salary is based on your previous salary, we're always going to be behind. So pro tip, and a lot of places in the US are starting to make that question illegal in the yeah. interview process. But thing to know about that, um, and then another thing for you to Google later um, is a presentation on doing the glue work because this is the work that women do. We bring teams together, um, we help people, we're emotional support, and sometimes that comes at the expense of our technical skills, and then when a promotion comes up, it's, oh, well, you haven't dedicated enough time for this, and we're like, well, we've been busy doing literally everything fucking else, like right. trying to crush the patriarchy. And the, the opposite of that, or not, not the opposite, but the sort of mirror image of that, is maybe there's a man on your team who would be really good at organizing the next outing, or whatever. And they're too busy you know, contributing code that might not be as good as Jennifer's code, and Jennifer doesn't want to organize the next outing. Um, but because of the patriarchy, we end up just kind of assuming that things will happen. Um, and it can be subtle. It's, it's really easy when you give specific examples, it's really easy to sit back and say, oh, yeah, but I would never assume that. Um, and I'm just kind of assuming that I still am sexist because it's very, very likely. And I almost certainly still have racist attitudes as well. And I will try, by being aware that I probably still do, I've got more of a chance of fighting back against them and being aware of them. Um, and women, you're probably sexist as well. I am sexist. <laughs> right. But as long as I'm aware, I can continue working on it. That's why it's so, uh, there's a word that I can't remember now, but it, it, it's really horrible the way that patriarchy gets under the skin of all of us. Thank you, thank you. Insidious <laughs> is exactly the word I was trying to remember. Thank you so much. So let's use that to segue into mental health because I think this is the, one of the biggest issues. Like, yes, sexual harassment is bad. Yes, the gender, gender pay gap is bad. Uh, but one of the awful things about the patriarchy is the expect, expectations that it forces on men. Men have to be strong. Men can't cry. Men can't show emotions other than anger. And men cannot admit um, that they might have a weakness or they might not be perfect. And this really, really hurts with mental health. Men don't feel comfortable talking about mental health issues. They don't feel comfortable talking about their depression. Um, oftentimes this comes out where they're very dependent on their partners to manage their emotional state, and that's not good for anyone. We're getting nods from art here. We're, we're doing well. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> if if y'all ever like want good mental health, uh, 
insight. Art does a fantastic, fantastic talk. So when the videos are up, watch Art's talk as well. Yes. And downvote all the negative YouTube comments uh, that all the women's videos will get every time, <laughs> yeah. every time. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, and this isn't something we talk about enough as a society because we're not supposed to, because men aren't supposed to have issues. Men aren't supposed to be not strong, masculine people who can show vulnerabilities. And I, I don't know how I seem to have escaped that to some extent in that I've never had a problem crying, I will go to Les Mis and just weep buckets. Um, I'm quite happy to show weakness. Maybe it's because I've never, I've never had a strong masculine body to, to be particularly macho about, but it's never been a problem. And I don't know whether that sort of makes me more, if I say susceptible to feminism, that sounds like feminism's a bad thing, but you know, uh, uh, receptive to feminism to start with. It's like, well, yeah, of course that's a stupid thing to do. Why on earth would anyone feel that they can't tell their partner that they're feeling sad? Like, what kind? What kind of partner would you be with that you couldn't tell when you're feeling sad? What? What? That was that. Yeah. <laughs> I finished. <laughs> no! <laughs> All right. Um, awkward for me to segue. Privilege. Well, who? Uh, so, when we talk about privilege, I wrote a blog post about privilege and got a, uh, some tweets saying, no one's ever given me anything. Um, and you sort of... Being privileged doesn't mean uh, the same as nepotism. It's not saying someone has given you a job just because you're a man. It just means that maybe you didn't have as many barriers as if you'd been a woman, or if you'd been black, or various other things. Um, so Jennifer's example early on was brilliant. I have the privilege of going on the internet and not being sent dick pics. Does that, does that sound like a privilege? <laughs> Like, it's, it's, it's an odd word for it. That sounds like normal to me. And this is the weird thing. From the perspective of someone who's privileged, privilege is normal. And privilege is generally the way that I think the world should be. Okay? My life experience has been people mostly treating me the way I think is reasonable to be treated. And... That has a bit of cognitive dissonance with the word privilege, which sounds like a, you know, a, a premium membership kind of thing. But this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. Okay, So think back to that. Uh, if someone says privilege and you think, I've never been given anything, yeah, but have you been sent dick pics every day that you've been on the internet? Or been you know, sent rape threats or whatever it is? Uh... Yeah, life, life on the internet as a woman could be an entire fucking talk, but um, I was getting coffee with one of my mentees, and, and she's uh, in university her first year and starting to speak, um, and she was like, well, I wanted to talk to you about Twitter. Do you ever get abusive messages on Twitter? And I'm like, uh, yeah. And she's like, well, I told my parents, and they freaked out, and I'm like, well, okay, you're a woman on the internet, and if you do anything, you're going to get that kind of message. As long as they don't know your home address or anything, ignore, block, move on. But this is the reality that you have to deal with. And I'm not saying that we should have to deal with it. I'm saying this is the world we live in, and this right. is normal, so we can curb our expectations, and maybe someday we can apply for a membership with dick pics excluded. <laughs> So, if that's sort of the, the shitty world we live in now, what could it look like? I mean, you gave one interesting <laughs> example there, uh, but, but what would a better future look like, and how would it affect all of us? So, um, I am mostly a feminist because I care about women not being treated awfully, um, but I'm also a feminist because I believe that equality is better for everyone. Um, which just happens to be the tagline of the Women's Equality Party, um, and I'm sure was part of why I joined. Um, so imagine a world where people, where everyone gets that privilege of if you are white, male, straight, cis, um, reasonably wealthy, well-educated, uh, and in good health, so if, if you're ticking privilege bingo, you know, I've got all of those. Um, you know, there might be an extra aspect of privilege if you're also good looking, and I don't know kind of what that looks like. Um, but, or you know, have fashion sense. Um, but if, to me, a, a, gender, a, a nicely gender equal world sort of looks like everyone getting the same kind of treatment as I get. Um, but that's not 
terribly helpful in itself in that we need to look at the negatives in order to work out what to fix. But it can't just be looking at the negatives because it's very, um, it can feel very negative if you're saying, I'm removing things. And going back to it's, this talk isn't just about feminism, although it mostly is. Um, there are some things that will change the world that are all about removing something that's wrong. And those, I suspect, are more mentally taxing or men more emotionally taxing to work on because the better is just, well, it doesn't suck now. You know, it's like, yay, my test's passed. Well, yeah, my test's passed, but I still need to build the new feature. Um, whereas other things are, hey, look at this new bright world that will be after I've implemented something positive. And feminism has the joy of being both. So there are definitely terrible things that need fixing, but we can look towards a, a wonderful future if we ever get there. And it doesn't have to be big. Um, how many people say guys when addressing a group of people? Sorry, say guys. Guys. I try not to. So I'm from the Midwest. Guys is pretty gender neutral in our consideration, but it's become apparent that not everybody feels that way. And so it's so small to change one little word in your vocabulary, right? And especially like when I'm speaking on stage, I'm like, all right, guys, check this out. And so I have worked really hard to say y'all instead. And it's just like this tiny little thing. Yep. And it's not going to change the world overnight, but it's going to get us a step closer. You can take these baby steps to help make the world a better place. And sometimes you're likely to screw up. And you can use that as a positive thing. So I remember this. Um, I was in Moldova, um, which sort of sounds like it might be a made-up country name, but it's not, and it's a really beautiful place. Um, and I was giving a talk, and I said, guys, and then I stopped and corrected myself, which took, instead of it being a negative thing because I perpetuated a stereotype, it highlighted the fact that it needed fixing. So that hopefully, if whoever was speaking next would normally say guys, maybe they say, said guys a little bit less. So it's always worth um, thinking about how you can turn screw-ups into positive things. And we'll talk about that I was about to say, we should more. probably get to that quickly. Yeah, let's, I, let's go I for it. I feel like we've covered we that must... a lot. Oh, this, so, oh, you, you. <laughs> Sorry, this is one of my favorite things, because again, we've been talking about this idea of rigid gender roles, what men can't do, what women can't do, and I'm saying can't ironically, right? But this, is, uh, this idea of really rigid gender roles that we're forcing people into that we shouldn't, and uh, crushing the patriarchy means crushing typical gender roles. Um, I don't know if you've ever read a story online about like a little boy who goes to the fair and the tattoo or like the face tattoo artist won't give him a butterfly in his cheek because it's, it's too girly. Um, and the same, like girls never being allowed to play with trucks or cars or toys and given dolls and things like this. This idea of, of gender roles that we're forcing people into are bullshit. And especially as, you know, those people who identify as non-binary have, have drawn attention to the issues and, and the ways they feel and the ways they face, Gender roles aren't good for anyone. Gender roles, or sushi roles, not gender roles. And there's a fantastic uh, thread that you, we will link to later on. Um, we've, got a, we've got a currently empty GitHub repo that we are going to dump huge numbers of resources on, uh, more than you could ever read, I'm sure. OK, uh, this is really good. And is the next slide the dangers and whatever? Uh, oh, we'll have, we'll have dangers in a minute. I, we can talk to injures now, and I'll just go back. Yes. Wait. OK, okay. Yeah. so uh, it was how to gain perspective, and here are the opportunities, strengths, and dangers. So talking about dangers in particular, um, I wrote a blog post um, a couple of years ago. I've blogged a fair amount about feminism and need to do more. Um, but I wrote a blog post that the, the intent was good, and I still think that if I had expressed it more carefully and better, um, would largely have been less, uh, less controversial. And it was pretty much, uh, I would like there to be better ways that, that men can explore feminism without feeling that, like they'll be shouted at. Um, but I expressed it in a bad way that um, sort of sounded like I was equating um, being shouted at for not understanding feminism with like being sexually assaulted and things. So, you know, I, I use the term safe place and you know, putting my head above the parapet and things. And it's like, yeah, no, I was never in significant danger expressing any controversial opinions about feminism. Um, so I wrote this blog post and happened to link to a few authors uh, who I particularly admire, one of whom was Ima O'Toole, who wrote a fantastic, fantastic book on gender performativity. 
uh, which we won't go into now, uh, but called Girls Will Be Girls. Read that, it's awesome, and gives brilliant stuff about politics as well. Um, and she tweeted back and was saying, you know, oh, have you looked at what the responses were like in terms of how many men thought that was a good post versus women thought that was a good post? And I said, yeah, OK, well, it's mostly kind of 90 10 of men liking it versus women liking it. But then actually, my Twitter followership is about 90 10. Um, in terms of who I follow, it's rather better. Um, but then Ema took the time to write sort of a 13 post tweet thread about why it was problematic. And that was awesome that she'd taken the time to do so in a compassionate way. And initially, I felt like that high. I felt awful that here was one of my heroes saying, you should really feel bad about yourself. And she didn't say it. She didn't say that. But that's how I felt. And then I took the time to go back and sort of read what she'd said. Yep, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. OK, this was a problem. So I uh, added something at the top of the post. So I don't like revisionism, so I didn't sort of fix the post, but added, OK, the below post is problematic for these reasons, uh, but I'll leave it there anyway. But again, it's turning something into a learning opportunity. So where we had a slide saying how to become more aware, it's like if someone is taking the time to compassionately critique you, then take that, you know, take that message absolutely uh, to heart. And don't make it think that that means you're an awful person, but you can learn so much from that kind of thing. So as a guy embracing feminism, uh, our dangers are relatively low. Uh, if a woman had written the same post, or a woman had written a post that men would have disagreed with, um, it would have been doxing and death threats and rape threats and things. It's just the contrast in how the internet reacts to stuff. Even articles about feminism, you know, someone can say that, I, oh, John's a pussy, or uh, John's a, a soy milk guy, or there's something around you know, testosterone levels and things. It's like, I reckon I'm just going off on it. Sorry? Soy boy. Soy boy, yeah. Um, I'm just going off on a limb, but I reckon that's not as bad as a rape threat, personally. I, yeah, I can laugh that off relatively easily. Uh, no one is photoshopping you know, my head onto some porn body or whatever. Um, so the dangers are relatively low, but the, the initial danger was assuming that I had listened enough already. And actually, it's quite good to express what you're thinking currently so that you can be corrected. But just don't assume that you're now in a situation where you can objectively look over whatever problem it is you're looking at um, with more understanding than the people who've been in the trenches for years. Um, I would like to point out that the, the act of going through, and, and even not compassionately, but explaining how somebody's point of view might not be accurate is also an immense amount of emotional labor. Yes. Um, I was at a conference um, last fall, and they were doing open spaces. And so I was waiting on our open space to, to get ready. And so I sat down at a table, and there's like a younger guy and an, an older guy. And the younger guy looks at me and is like, hey, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, waiting on an open space. And he's like, did you learn anything cool? I just learned about this. Have you ever heard of it? And I was like, no, because it wasn't related to what I do. And he's like, oh, clearly you're not nerdy enough to be here. Whoa. And so this was great, because like, the, the older dude next to him just like slides down in his chair and is like fucking waiting for me to pop off. But I was just like, y'all, I'm so fucking sick of like having to explain why this is wrong. I've been running a women in tech nonprofit for five years. I'm fucking sick of talking about diversity. It takes so much emotional energy for me yep. to explain why something is wrong or why it's inappropriate. So if you can be cognizant of the fact that you're even giving, getting feedback is an immense amount of labor on somebody yes. else's part, um, that's huge. This also really plays into sexism when we talk about this idea of international, intersectional feminism, not just being white woman. Black women have it so much harder. Women of color have it so much harder than even like you know women getting you know the typical rape and death threats all the time. We don't have half the racial issues that they deal with, and it's a lot of emotional labor on their part to explain why you shouldn't call black women angry or how they're getting microaggressed at work. And so, if we're cognizant of the amount of effort and can do research and learning and and find introspective on our own, we can reach towards a brighter future. Which means if the reaction is piss off, you're being sexist, then you just accept it. And if the reaction is, 
someone actually taking the time to put in that emotional labor, your response is, thank you. Okay, even if you're feeling like crap because you tried to do something good and, and it was being thrown back in your face, but thrown back in your face with effort in a compassionate way, you say thank you and you learn. Uh, we should take a, a moment uh, to talk about the opportunities and strengths briefly. Wait, opportunities and strengths? <laughs> we were on, on the slide. Oh, you want that? Yeah. Okay. Um, just to be a little bit more upbeat. So uh, <laughs> we are in software, we do amazing things, and that gives us various opportunities and strengths. And I want to uh, raise one that may sound like it's a dirty word, but probably most of us have one privilege um, above at least most of the population, and that's in terms of finance. So in almost any social venture that you may be thinking of, you know, climate change, global fishing, whatever it is, chances are uh, you are making more money than most of the people who are fighting that battle at the moment. Do not be afraid of using that money for good. Um, don't feel it's a dirty thing to help. Chances are money is going to be required and that's one strength that most of us will have. Um, there may be other strengths in terms of, you know, if you know how to write a good design doc, then maybe that will be appropriate for helping to plan something around the, uh, the particular aspect. But I know that we can sometimes be embarrassed of having cash, and don't be, just use it for good stuff. Cool. End it might make time. Jennifer cry when her nonprofit treasurer is like, hey, we just got this donation. Do you know who John Skeet is? <laughs> yes. So, where do we want to go? Intersectional feminism? Okay. Uh, wow, cool. <laughs> Um, so again, we, we touched on this a little bit, and um, the feminist movement is, is a bit in disorts right now um, because we have all these different blocks because you've got some feminists who are like women only and they're not inclusive of transgender women or people who are non-binary, um, which is just so mind-boggling that we all suffer the same kind of abuse and um, disservices, so why are we all not supporting each other? And different kinds of abuse as well. Yes. Um, so out of some interest, how many of you have heard of intersectional feminism? Okay, and how many of you uh, would feel confident in being able to explain at least your understanding of it to someone else? Okay, good, right, so it is definitely worth, worth covering. So intersectional feminism is precisely what Jennifer was talking about, that black women will experience sexism in a different way, and they'll experience racism in a different way than black men would experience racism. And it, the, the intersection of sexism and racism is typically given as the example, but it is far from the only one. Um, so this comes into class and disabilities and education and you know, where you were born and all kinds of things. And it really, um, the interesting aspect to me is I was giving a talk on my faith in my church on Tuesday um, and used intersectional feminism as sort of a real connection with my faith that uh, just as I believe God treating each person as individual, that's part of intersectional feminism. It's everyone has a different journey and will have experienced all these prejudices in different ways. And if we're not aware of that, it's like huge blinkers. So, uh, yeah, feminism as a movement has had some awful times in terms of uh, white women excluding black women or excluding by talking over the top of and not allowing into leadership positions, etc. So, like, feminism is not um, immune from exactly the kind of prejudices. Um, as an, another small example, uh, Jennifer mentioned trans women. Um, an example of how the patriarchy does weird things in terms of representation. Um, I have a trans daughter and only became aware through reading things about um, the number of people who are non-gender conforming who would identify as trans from uh, assigned female at birth and are men versus assigned male at birth and are women versus are non-binary. So I'm not going to ask for people to guess sort of what those proportions, out of that population, what proportion are each. But based on a, a Stonewall survey, it's roughly 50% being non-binary, 25% being female to male, and 25% being male to female. And if you looked at media representation, you would never have guessed that, because you only ever see trans women, pretty much. And they're always sexualized. 
So that's just another example, and they will experience all kinds of different prejudices, and the trans community- I will community... get death threats on the internet, they will actually be killed. Right. Yes. Yes. And when there is a day uh, commemorating trans people who have been killed for basically being trans, then some feminists will then say, oh, but what about the women? And we suddenly get what aboutism from feminism. So we've hopefully been giving a positive, having just said feminism gets it wrong, that's people who are feminists. Feminism itself doesn't support, you know, as an ideology, doesn't support that. But it's just people are, are not perfect, and we should expect that always with all people. I often explain feminism as a sliding scale. Um, I remember when I was younger and considered myself a feminist, but I would also use the S word. I would call other women sluts. And I wasn't that far progressed in my feminist views to realize a woman's sexuality and her ability to express it um, is, is human right, it's human nature, and she should not have an identifier like that. She is not against the feminist movement because she's dressing provocatively. She is owning herself and owning her body and owning her sexuality, and that is not something we should be condemning women, women for. Um, so, and, you know, so if you consider yourself a feminist, know that you will fuck up, know that there are points of view you have not considered before, um, and, and that's okay, as long as you're introspective and as long as you're learning and understanding and increasing your awareness of the world around you and, and how others see it and experience it, um, that's all you can ask of yourself. Yep. And so we, we mentioned whataboutism and likewise the not all men, well, not all Furbies do awful things. You know, we, we see one Furby that's committed some vile crime against smaller Furbies, whatever it is. Oh, but not all Furbies are bad. So, Understanding the whole... <laughs> It'll be in the video. Understanding why there's so much anger at the whole, not all men are like this. Yeah, enough of us are that it's a problem and just saying not all men doesn't remove any responsibility from all of us for fixing the problem. I have been sexually assaulted enough uh, at events that I am perfectly fine wearing a backpack to avoid anybody to be able to get in that space and like touch my ass or do anything like that. Yes, not all men have sexually assaulted me, but how the fuck am I supposed to know if the guy behind me is gonna right. do that or not? And as of interest, any men wear a backpack for that reason? No, I don't either. <laughs> Learn <laughs> something new. But hey, it's okay because feminism sorted everything already. We already have equality, right? No, we absolutely don't. Well, actually, the pay gap is a myth. <laughs> uh, I have no idea where we are on slides or time now. How, where, where are we on? Two minutes. OK, <laughs> we should probably go to the conclusion. Uh, boop, boop. And I will point out that I did this one. Ah. <laughs> I'm learning. Uh, uh, take a photo of that. That's where our resources will be, Furbies and Feminism. Yep, it is currently empty. And it's Watching only on cameras. my GitHub rather than Jennifer's GitHub because I happened to be on the laptop at the time. <laughs> yeah, my laptop was serving that. We were doing live edits on his. Yes. Cool. Wait for Everyone got the photo if they want it. Uh, so yeah, we wanted to conclude with you know, calls to action. So um, hopefully you've now got a more positive view of feminism or you want to come and talk to us and say you're wrong because, which is absolutely fine. Um, or maybe you're thinking, okay, now I will go and take the first step in terms of doing something about that thing I've always thought, isn't it awful that, but I'm just going to sit in my chair and not do anything. Maybe it will be this evening after PubConf, which hopefully you're all coming to, uh, you will do a bit of research and find out what other organizations are already trying to do something and join them and contribute what you can, which may well partly be cash. Um, but, but do something. You know, we say that we're trying to change the world. Changing the world should not be just about producing yet another web app. And uh, this uh, Nitai car uh, means tickle me, but only with consent. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should conclude, really. It feels awful for a man to have the last word in a feminism talk. Uh, like, we kind of covered a lot of ground here. Um, I guess my biggest thing is just it's, it's okay. Like, we're all going to make mistakes. We are imperfect human beings. But as long as we're considerate and compassionate towards others and can think about ways that we can change the world and, and do what we can to be better tomorrow than we were today, that's all we can ask of you. Feel free to rant at us later. <laughs> <laughs>